That was quite as quick as come to, to attention for Monday. Must have been a good weekend. It wasn't the weekend before finals, so that's good. So we are in the home stretch. Four more lectures to go and we're done. I'll see how much I can cram into there, because I know that you guys will want to get the maximum amount for your dollar, right? At least for You just want to call the week off, is that right? Well, much as we would like to do that, we can't. So. All right. Um, today I'm going to finish up talking about uh, metabolism of lipids. And I may even get a little bit uh, ahead uh, and get us talking about uh, photosynthesis, which would be unusual if I do that. But if I do that, uh, that would be great. Um, let's see. So I've got all the videos posted and everything, so we should be set with that. And... Um, Let's talk about the synthesis of fat. Okay? So, the synthesis of fat is um, unfortunately very simple. Okay? Now, not unfortunately for you learning about it, because that's uh, the good side of it, but the unfortunate side of it is it's much easier to make fat than it probably should be. If it were harder to make fat, we probably wouldn't have so much issue with obesity. If we had easier ways to burn it off, we wouldn't have so many issues with obesity. But we didn't evolve under conditions relative to obesity. We evolved under conditions where we had food for periods of time and other periods of time where we had very little food. So having that built-in uh, reservoir to make fat was very important. As I've alluded to earlier, uh, the um, synthesis of fat uh, overlaps with the um, uh, synthesis of phosphatidyl compounds. We're going to see them in just a minute. But phosphatidyl compounds, I'll remind you, are glycerophospholipids that um, start with phosphatidic acid, which is a glycerol that has two um, fatty acids attached to it. And at the third position, there's a phosphate. So that's what phosphatidic acid actually is. And what's that stupid thing? Get rid of that. OK. Um, that's phosphatidic acid at the, at the very top. OK. So if we were going to make a phosphatidyl compound, we would take that phosphate and we would add something to it. Um, instead, we are going to uh, make a fat. So to make a fat, it's very simple. We clip the phosphate off, as you can see right there. And then in the place where the phosphate was, we have a um, molecule of um, diacylglycerol. And diacylglycerol turns out not to be a trivial um, consideration in the overall process. Diacylglycerol. We don't talk about signaling much in this class at all, but diisoglycerol is an important compound in signaling. And signaling is a phenomenon where uh, cells are communicating with their environment. And um, there's other ways of making diisoglycerol than this, but suffice it to say that um, the bottom line is that making diisoglycerol is um, a way to make a signaling molecule. Signaling molecules, as I said, uh, help um, the cell to communicate with the environment and they um, carry a message about something to do. And uh, this guy, because of its structure, is found and it's embedded in the membrane. OK. Um, well, making a fat then turns out to be a very simple matter to go from diisoglycerol to making a fat. You simply take a fatty acid, which has uh, been attached to CoA. So by the way, an acyl-CoA, which is what you see right there, means it's an acyl group. An acyl group is basically a fatty acid, an acyl group attached to a CoA. So we have an acyl CoA that donates the fatty acid. The CoA comes off, and we are left with a fat. So that's all there is to making a fat. Very, very simple to do. Um, as I noted earlier, fat is stored not in regular cells, but instead it's stored in specialized cells in the body known as adipocytes. And that's where these processes occur. OK. OK. So um, in the very uh, last step in the synthesis of fat, we have the 1,2 the two, two diisoglycerol, um, which uh, then is combined with the acyl group of an acyl-CoA. The acyl group becomes attached to position 3. That makes the fat. And then the uh, CoA is, is left to go its own, its own direction. Okay. 
Okay, so that's the synthesis of a fat. As I said, uh, unfortunately, very, very simple. We um, do not, as I noted last time, we do not regulate the synthesis of fat. We regulate the synthesis of fatty acids, and you saw how that happened through the acetyl-CoA carboxylase, and, um, but we do not regulate the synthesis of fat. Okay. Actually, I, there's one thing I didn't mention about acetyl-CoA carboxylase. I will mention here because it's an important consideration in its regulation. I told you that there was allosteric regulation of acetyl-CoA carboxylase, and that was uh, through uh, citrate, which uh, stimulated it, and through palmitate, which inhibited it. But it turns out that the enzyme is also regulated by phosphorylation and dephosphorylation as well. So since we're talking about fat, it's probably appropriate that I should mention uh, the regulation of acetyl-CoA carboxylase because it makes the fatty, it starts the synthesis of fatty acids. Anyway, uh, phosphorylation this is a very interesting enzyme. Phosphor, the, the enzyme uh, is most active when it's in a polymeric form. So the, the, the enzyme forms long polymers. Units join one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And they're so large, you can actually see them in a light microscope. So they're very, very uh, long, large units. The dephosphorylated form is the form that is in the uh, polymer. Okay? The dephosphorylated form is the form that's in the polymer. The phosphorylated form is the form that's in the monomer. Okay? Now, if we think about what happens with phosphorylation inside of cells, it gives us a clue. We don't have to memorize is phosphate on or off the active form. Okay? So when we talked about glycogen phosphorylase, remember we put a phosphate onto glycogen phosphorylase, what happened to it? It became very active. We put a phosphate onto glycogen synthase, which is the corresponding anabolic enzyme, and it became inactive. And so in general, when we're putting phosphates onto enzymes, we're going to be activating enzymes that are favoring breakdown, and we're going to be inactivating enzymes that favor synthesis. Okay. So acetyl-CoA carboxylase is an enzyme that's involved in synthesis. And so putting a phosphate onto it causes it to become inactive. Taking the phosphate off makes it active. So it's like the glycogen phosphorylase, glycogen synthase uh, systems as well. Because glycogen synthase, you put a phosphate onto it, it becomes inactive. You take the phosphate off, and it becomes uh, active. OK. Um, so that's uh, the story of regulation of the um, fatty acid synthesis as well as the synthesis of the triisoglycerols, which are otherwise known as fats. Okay. Now, um, the related set of compounds that I talked about before are um, the phosphatidyl compounds, and the phosphatidyl compounds also um, are synthesized from phosphatidic acid. The synthesis of these compounds can look kind of big and hairy and um, it's really not, okay? So first of all, you're not going to draw structures, which is part of what makes it look kind of big and hairy. Uh, but suffice it to say that the aim is really the most important thing here. The cell is interested in making phosphatidyl compounds. Why does the cell want to make phosphatidyl compounds? What's it using them for? So what? Not energy storage, no. What do cells do with phosphatidyl compounds? Cell membrane. Cell membrane. So they're part of the lipid bilayer. All right? So they uh, need to have these compounds if they're going to have membranes. So the aim is getting something onto that phosphate. All right? Now, I'm going to show you a couple ways in which that can happen. All right? But the important thing is, is that we're putting something onto that phosphate. All right? Uh, the exact mechanism by which it happens isn't the most important thing. Well, here's one way it can happen, okay? We can make a uh, diacylglycerol, okay? And so, in other words, we're taking phosphatidic acid and we're combining it with CTP to make CDP diacylglycerol. We're clipping off a phosphate and putting a CDP on there is what we're doing, all right? Well, why are we doing that? Well. The last time we talked about doing that was when we made uh, the intermediate UDP glucose for glycogen synthesis. Why did we do that? What was the purpose? So that's exactly right. 
So we were making a high energy intermediate, an activated intermediate, in the case of UDP glucose, so it would have energy to donate to make a glycogen. All right? Well, we're doing the same thing here, but instead of using UDP, we're using CDP. Now, it's interesting we think about the four nucleotides that are present inside of cells. All right? We think of them as, well, they make up the four, they make up RNA, they make up DNA, and we've got energy that comes from them. All right? But in fact, these four nucleotides are intimately involved with all cellular processes. They're intimately involved. Okay? So in the case of the diisoglycer in the case of the um, phosphatidyl compounds, we see that CTP is involved. In the case of the synthesis of glycogen, we see that GTP is, uh, I'm sorry, that UDP is involved. In the case of translation, we see that GTP is involved. And in the case of everything else in the cell, we see that ATP is involved. So all four nucleotides are involved in very, very important cellular processes. That means, then, that the cell needs to have plenty of these nucleotides if it's going to go forwards. But more importantly, the levels of these give indications to the cell about where it is, not only from an energy perspective, but also where it is from the perspective of making compounds that it needs to make. Now, these are very important decisions cells have to make because cells have to divide. And they have to decide, do we have enough resources to go ahead with starting the division process? That's true whether it's a bacterial cell or that's a human cell. Well, by sort of watching and measuring the nucleotide levels that it has, it has a very good indication about where it stands with respect to the ability to go forward with that uh, decision to divide. Okay. Well, we've made an activated intermediate here. I'm getting off the subject. Made an activated intermediate in the case of CDP diisoglycerol. All we have to do now is replace that CDP with a serine in this case. Instead of splitting off CDP, we split off CMP. We leave one of the phosphates behind. And we've made phosphatidyl serine. We could just as easily um, uh, take this off and put a choline on there instead of serine, and we would have phosphatidyl choline. In the case of serine, we can modify it, and if we modify it, we end up with something called phosphatidyl ethanolamine. Right? Well, again, I don't, you're not going to be drawing these, these uh, structures or anything like that. The bottom line is we're putting something out here onto this phosphate, and one of the ways of doing it is by using an activated intermediate. Okay? That activated intermediate allows us to make other phosphatidyl compounds, and there's several variations on this theme of making different phosphatidyl compounds. Okay? We can make phosphatidyl ethanolamine in several uh, different ways, and I'm just showing you this for your, for your own information. You don't need to um, worry about the different ways in which we can make it. Suffice it to say, cells have an abundance of ways of making phosphatidyl ethanolamine, which is one of the more important lipids in the um, glycerol phosphate, uh, I'm sorry, in the lipid bilayer. Okay. And you can see all kinds of other ways in which we make phosphatidyl ethanolamine and interchange those with phosphatidyl serine. Okay. Well, the um, sphingolipids um, are also lipids that we find inside of membranes. We tend to find sphingolipids more inside of neural membranes than we do in uh, other cellular membranes, although they are found in other cellular membranes as well. Okay. Uh, sphingolipids um, are derived as a starting point from uh, palmitoyl-CoA, which is just palmitic acid linked to a CoA, plus the amino acid serine. Okay. So if we want to make sphingolipids, those two are our starting points. We then go through a series of reactions to get to something called sphingosine, which is a precursor to the sphingolipids. Okay. Sphingosine, if we take and we put a fatty acid onto it, and you can see the fatty acids going on right here where that amine group was, put a fatty acid on right there, we make something called a ceramid, C-E-R-A-M. I D E. Okay. At that point, we have a, um, a, a, a one of a class of sphingolipids. Ceramids can get modified 
and they usually are modified by addition of either a phosphate onto the end, if we're going to make some kind of sphingomyelin, or they put a, a single sugar on there if we're going to make a cerebricide. We put a complex mixture of sugars on the end of it if we're going to make a gangliocide. So those are the possibilities that we have for uh, the different sphingolipids uh, that we're going to synthesize. Okay. Um, I should also mention one of the things about sphingolipids isn't so much their synthesis as much as it is their breakdown. Sphingolipids, I showed you earlier in the term, have some really great, big, hairy, uh, the gangliosides in particular, have some great, big, hairy carbohydrate structures stuck onto them. And as I've noted, they're important in neural tissue, particularly in your brain. Um, and sphingolipid metabolism is a very common uh, source of genetic disease and retardation. So the inability to break down some of the more complex sphingolipids in our brain, remember we have to synthesize and we also have to break things down over time. The inability to break down some of the gangliosides uh, leads to severe brain uh, problems, including uh, retardation. Okay. Well, cholesterol um, is uh, uh, something I'm going to spend probably most of the rest of the period talking about. Cholesterol is a really interesting compound um, in many ways. All right? Since the inception of the Nobel Prize, there have been something like five Nobel Prizes that have been won by people studying cholesterol, and we still don't know everything there is to know about cholesterol. When you hear the word cholesterol today, we associate cholesterol with heart attack or stroke or something really horrible and awful. But as I've noted before, cholesterol is important for our membranes. So our body needs cholesterol and it makes cholesterol. And understanding something about cholesterol is important for us as we're uh, going forward. Now, uh, specifically today, we're going to start with the synthesis of cholesterol. We don't really break down cholesterol. We excrete it in our feces. That's one of the ways in which we get rid of it. Um, but we don't really uh, uh, break it down per se. We convert it into other things. We convert cholesterol into uh, steroid hormones. We can convert uh, cholesterol into bile acids, but we don't really break it down uh, per se. Well, let's start with the synthesis of cholesterol first. Interestingly, cholesterol, what, what is this on the screen? The C and the M and the C and the M and the C and the M, okay? Cholesterol in our body is synthesized completely starting with acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA has two carbons. One is a methyl group, and one is a carboxyl group, and that's what the M and C refer to here. So we can find the source of every single carbon in a cholesterol molecule, and we know whether it was a methyl carbon or a carboxyl carbon, and that's um, how we end up with a, um, a cholesterol. It's not as complicated as it might seem in some ways, and it's much more complicated than it would seem in other ways. The places where it would seem it would be complicated are actually simple, and the places where it would seem like it would be simple are actually complicated. Now, with that kind of an introduction, you're all sitting here going, oh my god, we're going to have to know a lot of stuff on this. Well, relax, it's not bad. I'll make it easy, I hope. All right, so how do we synthesize cholesterol? Well, we start with acetyl-CoA, all right? We start with acetyl-CoA, and we put three of these guys together, and we make something called mevalonate, all right? Now, along the way to making mevalonate, we had to make something called HMG-CoA. Anybody remember where we heard HMG-CoA before? It was intermediate in a certain process. Anybody remember? It wasn't that long ago, guys. Hint, hint. Ketone body synthesis. Okay? Ketone body synthesis overlaps with cholesterol biosynthesis. It overlaps with it. They both have an intermediate of HMG-CoA. Okay? Well, HMG-CoA gets reduced to make mevalonate. It's a reduction reaction that makes mevalonate. In the case of ketone body synthesis, it goes a different direction, all right? The reduction of HMG-CoA to make mevalonate is catalyzed by a very, very important enzyme. 
catalyzed by an enzyme known as, and we're not going to have other names for this one because it's an important enzyme. They're all important, I guess, at some level. It's called HMG-CoA reductase. It's a reduction, not a surprise, it would be called a reductase. HMG-CoA reductase. Now, why is this enzyme so important? Okay. Well, number one reason is it's the only enzyme that's regulated in cholesterol biosynthesis. It's the only enzyme that's regulated in cholesterol biosynthesis. Its regulation scheme is complex. It involves phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. And we won't really talk about that in this class. But what we will talk about is the fact that it's feedback inhibited. What does feedback inhibition refer to? Last step controls the first step. So the last step in the process is cholesterol. Cholesterol will feedback inhibit that enzyme. Cholesterol can bind to HMG, CoA, reductase, and inhibit it. Okay. All right. So that feedback inhibition is an important consideration because we don't want to make too much cholesterol. Sometimes we do, and sometimes we have too much cholesterol because we eat too much cholesterol. We'll talk about that in a bit, too. All right. Well, let's go through this scheme. So that enzyme, oh, another reason that enzyme is important, a very important consideration for that enzyme, is it's a target for drugs. So if you are told by your doctor your cholesterol levels are too high, the first thing your doctor is going to do is try to get you to change your diet to see if you can reduce the intake, because cholesterol in our body is there for three reasons. One is synthesis, two is diet, and three is storage. Cholesterol is in our body because of synthesis, diet, storage. Well, the easiest variable to control is diet. If you can reduce your, uh, or change your intake of cholesterol, and reduce your cholesterol levels, that's the best of all worlds. Whenever you can reduce the intake of medications, you're better off, and the doctor will try that. If that does not work, the doctor will, will most likely put you, you can't really change much in the way of storage. So if you can't change it with diet, the doctor will likely put you onto anti or, or anti-cholesterol synthesis medications that are known as statins, S-T-A-T-I-N-S. Statins inhibit HMG-CoA reductase. Statins inhibit HMG-CoA reductase. So HMG-CoA reductase is also a target of drugs. And they're very, very effective. Okay? There are a few side effects. They're not very major, but there are a few side effects with them. Muscle stiffness and soreness uh, a little bit. But for the most part, they're, they're not very... Um, um, problematic. The most common of the statins that's uh, given is called lovastatin. You don't need to know that, but statins are the, the class of compounds that are used to inhibit that. All right. Well, I keep talking about synthesis. Let's synthesize some cholesterol. All right. Well, the early steps that they said are the ones that you would think would be um, the, uh, <coughs> the most complicated, but they're actually fairly simple. They're putting building blocks together. So we put three building blocks together to get a six carbon compound. That goes and ultimately makes a five carbon compound. You see this is a six carbon compound. That gets decarboxylated down to make something we call isoprene. Now isoprene is not a specific molecule. It refers to a five carbon molecule. And there are two five carbon molecules that are known as the isoprene. And yes, they have mouthful of names, and no, we're probably not going to rename them. Okay. All right. So um, um, I got to pull their names out of my head. I can't. <laughs> for some reason, I can't do this at the moment. Uh, one's called isopentanyl pyrophosphate. Isopentanyl. Iso. I S O P E N T E N Y L. Pyrophosphate. So isopentanyl pyrophosphate is one of the five carbon units. 
The other one is called, everybody got that? The other one's called dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate. Dimethyl, D-I-M-E-T-H-Y-L, allyl, A-L-L-Y-L, pyrophosphate, P-Y-R-O, P-H-O-S, P-H-A-T-E. So the two compounds are isopentanyl pyrophosphate and dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate. Now, these two are what we call the building blocks of making cholesterol. If we take two five-carbon building blocks and we put them together, we make a 10-carbon building block. So one of the isopentanyls, one of the dimethyl allyls. We've got a 10-carbon building block called geranyl pyrophosphate, G-E-R-A-N-Y-L. If we add another five carbon unit to that, we've got a 15 carbon unit, and it's called farnesyl pyrophosphate. F-A-R-N-E-S-Y-L, and then pyrophosphate on the end. You can call it PP if you want, that's fine. Farnesyl PP, any of the pyrophosphates you can call PP. Okay, now, two of the farnesyls can be joined together to make a 30 carbon unit known as squalene. So we're just building blocks, building blocks, continuing to join units bigger and bigger. We're now up to 30 carbons, and 30 carbon uh, uh, squalene is one of the last of what we call the linear intermediates. Now, interestingly, Squalene, with its mixture of single and double bonds throughout the molecules, you'll see that, can be twisted and turned in such a way that it forms a molecule that has a ring structure that looks an awful lot like cholesterol. It's very, very similar looking to cholesterol. I won't ask you to know the name of it. It's called linosterol, but you won't need to know the name of that. Okay? But linosterol looks, if you look at it versus cholesterol, you'd say, oh, well, it's probably a fairly simple thing to go from linosterol to cholesterol, and that's the part that I said that looked like it should be simple, but it's actually very complicated. To go from linosterol to cholesterol, it's 19 more steps. And not only are there 19 more steps, but those 19 steps require a lot of ATP in the process. So the synthesis of cholesterol is something that's very, very energy demanding of the cell. The cell really should be carefully monitoring how much cholesterol it is making. And that's why the feedback inhibition of the HMG CoA reductase is very, very important. The cell doesn't want to be wasting energy on cholesterol. It's not going to use. OK. Well, the bottom line is we end up with cholesterol. Yes? So the two five-carbon isoprenes, isopentanyl pyrophosphate and dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate, Make geranyl pyrophosphate. That's correct. So then you get another five. I, I, don't remember, I don't remember which one it is myself, so it doesn't really matter. Then you to make 15, which is farnesyl pyrophosphate, two farnesyls to go together to make squalene, and then through a several steps, squalene is ultimately converted into cholesterol, and that's a long process. Okay? All right. So that's how we make cholesterol. All right. There's some of the steps in the process. Um, I've talked you through them. You can look at them. There's the mouthful of names. There's the farnesyl. There's the dimethyl allyl. There's the isopentanyl, et cetera. And finally, we get down here to make squalene. And then squalene, uh, there's the twisting and turning to rearrange this to make linosterol. And then there's a series of reactions. And as I said, notice it says many steps right there. It's 19 steps to get there. OK. Now, this shows cholesterol can go to other things. So we can put uh, a fatty acid onto that cholesterol. And if we do, we put it into what's called a storage form. This can be embedded in membranes uh, easily, in addition to cholesterol can also be embedded in membranes. But this can be kept uh, by the cell and then not used as cholesterol, but the fatty acid gets embedded in the membranes and the cell plucks off the cholesterol when it needs it, and that um, happens at will. 
Okay. The statins are here, and uh, the statins, um, let's see, where did I have? So here's an intermediate that occurs in HMG CoA reductase during the enzyme catalytic reaction. Here uh, is what the statins look like, and here's um, um, the resemblance to that intermediate. So you can see that they look very much like the intermediate that the enzyme normally catalyzes. The enzyme grabs these statins as competitive inhibitors, and um, the, the competitive inhibition of the enzyme stops it essentially from functioning. Okay. Cholesterol, as I noted earlier, can also be made into bile acids. So bile acids are very important in the process of digestion. That's the last thing I'll be talking about today. Um, and they're important because we eat fat, and fat is not soluble in water. And the environment of our stomach and the environment of most of our body is, in fact, water. So if we have grease and we want to get it off our hands, we take soap or detergent, and we wash our hands because it helps to solubilize that grease. Bile acids act as detergents to help solubilize fat in your digestive system. So bile acids are found in your bile. The bile comes from your liver and um, stored in your gallbladder. But um, the important thing is that they resemble cholesterol because they're derived from cholesterol, but they have some important differences. Notice the carboxyl group up here. This would indicate that it's got a polar side and a nonpolar side. That's a prime characteristic of a detergent. Okay. Um, they have various forms. Here's another. Here's glycocholate that has, again, a polar end, a nonpolar end. Um, and um, these are two of the most common uh, bile acids right here, cholate and glycocholate. They both come from cholesterol. OK. Steroid hormones can also be synthesized from cholesterol. Um, cholesterol is a precursor of this hormone called pregnenolone. And pregnenolone is a precursor of the uh, pregnancy hormone progesterone. Progesterone itself can be made into the other classes of hormones that you see on here, uh, one being aldosterone, which uh, helps regulate uh, minerals uh, and uh, mineral metabolism in our body, testosterone, the major androgen, the major male uh, sex hormone, and testosterone can be made into estradiol, the major female uh, hormone. I've talked before about um, how this enzyme that makes this is called an aromatase, and that we use aromatase inhibitors to stop the synthesis of estrogens for people who have tumors that are responding to estrogens. We've talked about that previously. And the last thing is progesterone can be made into glucocorticoids, uh, which are important for um, a variety of things, um, including uh, swelling and inflammation and uh, other uh, things in our body. Okay. Well, um, the last part of what I want to say, like I said, is that sort of following the digestive process and following cholesterol in our body. And this is a part um, of the process that I don't have a lot of good figures for, unfortunately. So a lot of it's me telling you about what's happening. But it's, and it's also a part of the process where we don't fully understand everything about it. So there's always, this is one of the most common places where students have a lot of questions about uh, the process. And a lot of times I have to say, well, we just don't know the answer to that. Well, Let's uh, first of all consider uh, the movement of cholesterol and fat and fat-soluble vitamins in our body. They all travel together. Okay, so let's uh, define some of the players in the in the game first, and then we'll talk about how they interact to do their thing. The players are known as lipoprotein complexes. That's the class name. That's a group of them. Within the lipoprotein complexes, we have the compounds that you see or the things that you see on the left side of the table. We have chylomicrons, we have VLDLs, we have IDLs, we have LDLs and HDLs. VL stands for very low, I stands for intermediate, L stands for low, and H stands for high. The DL stands for density lipoprotein. So a VLDL is a very low density lipoprotein. IDL is an intermediate density lipoprotein. LDL is a low density lipoprotein, et cetera. If you know the, the initials, that's all you need to know. Okay? Now, these are complexes 
that in case the fats, lipids, and cholesterol, so they can be carried in the aqueous environment of our body. Remember, we have to move these compounds through our body. All right? These go in size from the very large chylomicrons down to the smallest HDLs. Okay? Now, I'm going to tell you what happens with these guys as they travel through our body in just a second. I want to, uh, actually, I don't want to do that. Here. So I'll tell you about these complexes. All right. So let's imagine we've uh, gone out to lunch, and we've gone to Mickey D's, and we've just had gotten a Big Mac and a large order supersized fries, and we are going to sit down, and we are going to engorge that, uh, this thing that we have just ordered. Well, people are making faces. People do eat these things, okay? Um, I don't, but people do. <laughs> All right. So anyway, these uh, things typically are full of fat. So in addition to the protein and other things that you're getting there, uh, you're getting a lot of fat. So we're going to follow the fat, we're going to follow the cholesterol, and we're going to follow the fat-soluble vitamins, all of which are going to be in that, in that sandwich which you ate. Things that are water-soluble, we don't need to really think about or worry about too much. Okay? But these guys have a lot of fat. Well, we eat that, and it goes into our digestive system, and the very first thing that happens is our stomach starts grinding it, literally. Okay? There's a mechanical agitation that happens with our stomach, and that's partly to solubilize things, just for the same reason that a washing machine uh, has an agitate mode to help clean your clothes. So too does your stomach have a sort of a grinding thing to help to um, um, agitate the, um, the material that's there. That agitation helps because it's, it's uh, in the digestive system where the bile acids will be found, and the bile acids will help to emulsify, that is to make soluble those fatty compounds which are not soluble in water. Okay? So the very first thing is that. Then something interesting happens. Um, there are some enzymes that cleave one or two of the fatty acids off of the fat in the digestive system. Okay? Then what's left of that fat, which would be like a monoacylglycerol, is moved across the lumen of the intestine into the bloodstream. And it's moved along with the fatty acids that got taken off. And so once they get across the lumen of the intestine, they get put back on. So they're taken off, they're transported across, and then they're put back on. Okay? So we've gotten the stuff out of the lumen of the intestine. We now have fat that would like to travel through our body, excuse me, to target tissues, but it doesn't have a way to do that without assistance because it's not soluble in water. Okay? So the very first thing that happens to that fat, that cholesterol, those fat soluble vitamins, that's true for all these guys. The very first thing that's happening to them is that they get gobbled up by these complexes called chylomicrons. Right there. And these are great big honking complexes. They're loaded with fat, they're loaded with cholesterol, they're loaded with fat-soluble vitamins, and anything that's not soluble in water are contained within them. They are very large. <clears throat> and they travel through the lymph system and enter the bloodstream. That's what they do. They travel through the lymph, they enter the bloodstream. When they get to the bloodstream, they go a ways until they hit a capillary and they're so big, they can't get through it, and they get stuck. Now, you might think that chylomicrons are the source of heart attacks and things like that, but they're not. Okay? They're not. Because they're hitting the capillaries. The capillaries, the capillaries have a um, set of enzymes that will start literally eating the fat out of the inside of the Oreo cookie. The Oreo cookie, in this case, being the chylomicron. They will start digesting that fat and taking those fatty acids inside of them to use them for energy. 
They may take the fat-soluble vitamins as well. They do not take the cholesterol. The cholesterol stays there. So what happens is, as a result of this digestive process that's happening, the chylomicron, which was great big and honking, starts shrinking in size. <coughs> when it shrinks enough in size that it can fit through the capillaries, it just gets pushed through the capillaries. Okay? At that point, it's, what's we call, it's what we call a chylomicron remnant. A chylomicron remnant. Well, that chylomicron remnant now travels through the bloodstream back to the liver. Travels back to the liver. At the liver, the uh, chylomicron is absorbed. Okay? It's absorbed. Now, the liver is therefore playing a very big role in fat metabolism, in cholesterol metabolism, and in fat-soluble vitamin metabolism. It's no coincidence that your liver is full of vitamin A. Vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin. Okay? Well, your liver has a limited capacity. It can't hold infinite amounts. Right? If you are overweight, you probably are pushing your liver. If you're overweight, it's not uncommon to have cholesterol problems. And since if you're pushing your liver, pushing the ability for it to handle cholesterol is not a surprising thing that might happen. All right. Well, we've just begun the journey. All right. What matters at this point now is that the liver has to look out for the rest of the body. The liver looks out for the rest of the body with respect to glucose. We saw that in the Cori cycle, where the liver was providing glucose as the body was needing it. We'll also see that the liver is providing fat and cholesterol as the body needs it as well. But in order for the liver to provide these things to the rest of the body, it has to package them up itself. And so what it does is it packages them up in the form of what are called VLDLs, very low density lipoprotein complexes. And you can see that they are not as big and fluffy as the chylomicrons, but they're still pretty big and fluffy. The VLDLs get released by the liver. They go back out into the bloodstream. And the bloods, and they go out to the t capillary tissues or the target tissues, and the same thing happens that happened to the chylomicrons. <coughs> they get partially digested away. Notice I'm saying partially in all these. So there's still some fat left over in all these. They're getting partially digested away. They start getting smaller and smaller in size. The VLDLs become IDLs, intermediate density lipoproteins. The IDLs become LDLs, and it's the LDLs that we worry about. Because the LDLs are what your doctor will refer to as the bad cholesterol. It's the LDLs, the smallest of the ones we've talked about so far, that are involved in atherosclerosis and other problems associated with the cardiovascular system. But why are the smallest ones the problem? Well, we, we associate them with cholesterol because they have the highest concentration of cholesterol because most of the fat has been taken away. The LDLs turn out to be very susceptible to reactive oxygen species, meaning reactive oxygen will come and will damage the LDLs much more readily than it will any of the other complexes. When that happens, your body sees it as something that it needs to get rid of. So it will attack it. By the way, if you're a smoker, you have a lot more reactive oxygen species in your bloodstream, so this process I'm getting ready to describe to you happens much more readily. Okay? That's why smokers have a lot, much more trouble with atherosclerosis. LDLs get, got, start, get attacked by the immune system, and during the reaction process, when they're reacting with reactive oxygen species, they can actually get attached <coughs> to the arterial system. They can get attached. Well, if they get attached and the immune system attacks it, okay, one attack leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, you get this great big ugly mass that's there that people call foam cells. 
because it's a big foamy cluster of immune system cells, of LDLs, and that foam cell is the start of an atherosclerotic plaque. When we think about a plug, we think about a blockage of an artery, that's what's happening. And it's happening because these LDLs are getting oxidized. Okay? That's the bad cholesterol. Well, the good cholesterol is what we call HDLs. HDLs are scavengers of cholesterol from problem areas. They're scavengers of pieces of all these things that might be floating around. And HDLs are associated with getting cholesterol back home, taking it back to the liver and getting it out of the bloodstream where it's causing problems. When your doctor checks your cholesterol, if you have high HDLs and low LDLs, the doctor's going to be very happy. In fact, the higher your HDLs are, the happier your doctor is going to be. Okay? The lower your HDLs and the higher your LDLs are, the unhappier your doctor is going to be. What increases LDLs? Smoking, lack of exercise, poor nutrition. What's that? Big Max. Big Max. Right. What increases your HDLs? Exercise, a, a leaner diet, okay, and so forth. LDLs are also favored by saturated fats. Okay, so there's some words to the wise. Now, I want to tell you, and I've got a very brief thing for a story, and then we'll do a song, okay? Um, an interesting story. So, how is this whole process... Actually, no, I'll tell you what. Maybe I won't do that. I will save the story for you for next time, because it'll take me longer to tell you about how the... Um, uh, regulation of this occurs. Your body has a very interesting regulation system for controlling all of this. But I thought we'd finish this off. It's the perfect time for one of my favorite songs, and it's called <laughs> To Make a Cholesterol. It's the same tune we've been doing the last two songs to, all right? Some things that you can build with acetyl coase are joined together partly thanks to thiolase. They come together, one, two, three, six carbons known as HMG, and you're on your way to make a cholesterol, to synthesize a mevalonate in the cell. Requires reducing HMG CoA as well. The enzyme is a reductase controlled in allosteric ways when the cell's impelled to make a cholesterol. The mevalonate made in metabolic schemes gets decarboxylated down to isoprenes. They're linked together willy-nil to build a pp geranil in the cell's routines to make a cholesterol. A single step links farnesyls, but that's not all. The squalene rearranges to lanosterol. From that, there's 19 steps to go before the sterols apropos, which you must recall to make a cholesterol. The regulation of the scheme's complex in ways inhibited by feedback of the reductase and statins mimic, so they say, the look of HMG-CoA. So we sing their praise and not my cholesterol. All right, guys. See you tomorrow.